right, well, before we get the panel started, the first thing I want to do, I want to propose a toast. So if you have a drink, everyone put it up. I've got a Diet Coke. <laughs> that works. This panel right here is dedicated to two of the OGs of independent horror filmmaking that we recently lost to blaze the trail that these guys are now walking. So here is to Toby Hooper and George Romero. Oh, I'll drink to that. Ah, I've got the invisible drink. All right. Well, I'd like to thank you all for uh, coming here to the Independent Filmmakers panel. But I want to start off here. Well, we'll start right here. And we're going to go down, and I want everybody to uh, introduce yourself and tell us what you are, what your current project is, and what you're here promoting. Uh, my name is uh, Nathan Erdell, and I wrote Headless. Um, I'm not promoting anything, so I'm promoting uh, She Was So Pretty and Crazy Fat Ethel. And Woo! I'm Bobby Easley, and uh, this year we are producing four films, and I'm supposed to take a year off, but I'm here fishing for new ideas, so that's it. Uh, my name is... Hey, what's up? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is PJ Starks. I'm the creator and producer of the Volumes of Blood franchise. Um, I'm... Um, I'm mainly doing horror producing right now, so I'm working on several different films, Gnawbone, Angel, and like four or five others uh, at the moment. I've got a couple more that are coming. Volumes of Blood Horror Stories is the main film that just recently came out, and then I produced another movie called Butcher the Bakers that's going to be coming out in the next couple months, so that's pretty much what I'm doing. Thank you. Hey, I'm Brian Dorton, writer director of Crazy Fat Ethel, which is which is playing tonight at midnight here. It's a free screening, so come see the movie. Um, and one, now that this movie's done, I plan on taking a, about a year off, like he said, because I, I I actually I actually did two films recently back to back, and everybody's telling me to take some time off because you know as an independent filmmaker we put a lot more into our work than you would think because we do we wear you know 20 different hats or 40 different hats even so it's a lot more work than a hollywood film where you have a thousand people working on one movie with an independent film you may have 20 if you're lucky so oh i got i got like Uh, I'm Brooklyn Ewing. I made She Was So Pretty, and um, in a couple months I'm releasing She Was So Pretty, Be Good For Goodness Sake, the sequel that is a holiday horror film. So we're getting real Christmassy up in here. So it's going to be super fun. And tonight at 9 p.m. we're screening the original, the first one, and there are free Jello shots. What? Woo! And we're going to have live commentary, so come up, hang out, we're going to BS a bunch, and let's all get wasted. Yes! Yeah! Woo! I'll drink to that. And I'm uh, William Caps, and uh, also at the same screening as Crazy Fat Ethel, so our short films will be running if you want to see those. And actually, if you want to, there's um, a table back there. We let some, there's some discs that have copies of all our short films if you're interested in getting a copy of those. Uh, but worked on a bunch of short films, have a new one after the slasher that's not been released yet, so we've shown it tonight for the first time. And then there's some other ones we've been working on that will be coming out soon as well. You know, those of you who have been on panel before with me know what my first question always is, some of you will be new to. What was the first movie that you saw that in your mind took films from this is what people in Hollywood do to this is something that I can do? Let's start off right here. Uh, I think the uh, last time, uh, I, I'm going to stick with my answer that was from the last time, so if I'm repeating myself to people, I'm sorry, but I'm going to go with Phantasm. Uh, Phantasm was the first movie that I saw that had both like a, you know, it felt like a movie, you know, it was shot correctly and it had the right shot composition and it had actors that were halfway decent. But it also seemed like, oh, you can totally do this. You just go to a cemetery and you get some friends and you find somebody who has a Himaikuda. And um, yeah, so I would say uh, Phantasm. And I mean, it still holds up. It seems like a badass independent film. 
I normally say Dolomite, uh, Rudy Ray Moore, uh, just because the whole street, just it was hilarious seeing the boom mics dipping into the frame, all that stuff. But because uh, Toby Hooper and Texas Chainsaw Massacre, that is my favorite horror film. I actually went and visited every place they shot Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and a lot of them don't exist anymore because they've plowed highways and stuff through it, but that movie made me think, wow, it's just a couple people, and they're out here, and it seems like if you just write the story right, I think I could probably do something like this, and I think going to that lo those locations put me on the right path, like, oh, I'm actually here where this stuff happened. So it's step one, you know? So I'd have to say that, Texas Chainsaw. Um, ironically, the, the film that made me think, hey, I can make movies was not a horror film at all. It was Clerks. That was the one that I really <laughs> watched and, and, you know, and, you know, you love the characters and you, you, it just, everything about it. And I thought, hey, I could probably do that. Um, and ironically, I could. So uh, maybe not as well, but I could. And, um, but as far as... Um, like from a horror standpoint, I would say you know films like Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Um, I'm trying to think, of, I mean, I grew up watch. I, I've always grown up watching horror films. Ghostbusters was kind of the film that really got that piqued my interest in the paranormal, and then it went on to like the Monster Squad, hey, and uh, and films like that. But as far as like, hey, I can make films, or I, I really want to make films, I would say it was Clerks. Yeah, I'm gonna step out of the horror genre too. Um, I think anybody anybody that knows me knows my favorite film of all time is Heather's. And I've had um, my crush on Winona ever since. Um, but when I saw that movie, I was probably like 15 years old and I kind of decided around that time that I wanted to be a filmmaker. I never thought I would actually be a filmmaker, but you know, things happen, I met the right people, you know, and here I am. So I would definitely say Heather's would be the movie that made me want to be a filmmaker. Um, I would have to say it was, uh, it was Maniac for me. Um, it's dirty, it's disgusting, it's grimy, and basically, I mean, when you have a lead that'll do anything he chooses, and doesn't care about anyone else, that's that Texas Chainsaw Massacre feeling, like where they're like, oh, by the way, they're gonna put you in this disgusting room with all this rotten food, and guess what? We're just gonna do it anyway, suck it. It's, I, I think that feeling of like, hey actors, like this isn't gonna be easy, but you're gonna do it because you're gonna love it and it's gonna be incredible. So, Because I think making a good horror movie is all about everyone suffering together. But when it's over, what makes it great at the end though is you're like, okay we did something i mean it was shitty and we feel terrible and we're all exhausted and we never want to do it again but we're already writing something else then then afterwards you celebrate with beers and then you go yeah hell yeah let's do that again so it's that feeling of afterwards and i think maniac has that feeling in it like that gross feeling but then it became something even though it was just like some dirty trash you know so what you're saying is making a movie is like getting a tattoo. It's a painful process, but at the end, you have something that'll last forever. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Hey. See, uh, the movie that made me kind of go from watching movies as, you know, this Star Wars, Spielbergian thing you could never appreciate or accomplish to think I could do that was uh, the first Evil Dead. Listen to the director's commentary where they talk about being covered in caramel syrup and freezing in the Michigan wilderness and or Tennessee woods or whatever. Just uh, hearing about the, what was it, they threw a camera on a two by four and put it on a dirt bike or something. It's like, oh, so it's not a million dollar thing. You can just start piecing together things you have in your, your house or that you have access to and start making it. So that was when it went to me to this thing. It's like, oh, I can make something that might end up on the screen someday, uh, even if it doesn't have special effects or a budget, but <laughs> it could be possible. Now we're going to do things a little backwards here the way panels usually work. Before I start asking these guys questions, do we have any questions out there in the crowd for these guys? Anybody? Hands? All right, right here. Have you guys ever thought about getting together and writing a movie together? 
guys are always in the same grouping, the same everything. I want to be the cheerleader that makes that happen. Because I'm annoying. I'm annoying and positive, and people kind of hate my guts or love me. Like, because if you're really negative, you hate me instantly. Because I'm just like, let's do this. Woo! And everybody's like, shut the hell up. <laughs> but like, Screw it. I, why are we all like it's separate? We, yeah, we're working so, against each other. Yeah. And it's not on purpose. Like, but it, that's the way it is. When you have a market and we're all fishing out of it. Mm -hmm. Can I uh, your... really answer that? Yeah. Um, we have uh, Jason Hoover and I just shot a movie, The Dead Bodies, in 223 in seven days. Yeah. That was an incredible feat because everything he brought to the table and everything I brought to the table, and we didn't argue. We didn't step on each other's toes. We had a quiet moment. <laughs> where <laughs> we just got quiet and then we got like alright it's cool let's get back to work but yeah and I can't believe like I couldn't have done that by myself in seven days but to have two directors helming it that don't fight and <laughs> really like everything he shot or was wanting to shoot he's like check it out Bobby I look at him like it looks good to me and then everything and if I wanted to try something off the wall he's like go ahead try it and uh, it was like wow we're literally getting things in one take Jake that was our motto we got that one take Jake moving on yeah and then it's just the whole it's really cool it'd be like having two parents to raise a kid instead of one I'm really glad that we brought this up because I feel like especially online everybody's kind of like non-supportive towards the next guy for some reason it's like they feel like oh well you know you're doing this is it going to be better than what I'm doing and I just I don't really like that people seem to have that attitude about it because I reach out to anybody and, and welcome anybody to come to a set and, and add anything that would help me, you know, make the best film I can make. And I'm open to talking to anybody about an, a project or, or working with any of you guys. So, you know, I mean, hit me up. I'm always, you know, eager to do something. I'll get your coffee. Like, that's how much I don't give a crap. Like, I just want to work and have, I just want to be in all this. Let's just, I just want more magic. Like, I just want to make art. I know that sounds lame, but F money make, make some art. It's the, fin it's the final product that I think we're all in love with. Yeah. It's like once you get that final piece of art there and you're like completely satisfied with what you've done, that what that is what makes you pick up you know the keyboard and start writing the next script because you're so satisfied with what you just did anybody else any other questions all right i'll start uh, we'll start with you pj uh-oh now uh, you've written directed everything but you're primarily a producer right um i talked to a lot of you know film fans not even just independent fans but film fans and they're kind of unclear on what exactly the producer does because you know the director and that is always getting more press what exactly is the job of a producer? <clears throat> That's a good question. I'm still trying to figure that out myself, <laughs> actually. Um, I mean, for me, it's, I mean, I, I help out in various capacities. It, it kind of depends on, you know, what kind of, kind of producer work you're doing on the film. Like a line producer works with more along the lines of money. Um, I typically tend to do more like executive producing, which is, you know, I'll, I'll help, uh, you know, flesh stuff out in the script or, you know, give some advice or, um, I've been doing this seriously since 2007 and one of the things that I've really, uh, one of the areas I've kind of excelled in has been uh, promotion. Um, I'm kind of a self-professed media whore, actually. Um, so that's kind of what I really have to offer, like when it comes to, um, working with other filmmakers and helping other filmmakers because when I first started there was that there's that learning process where I'm making a movie and the whole purpose of of making it um, it's not you get to a point where it's not just about showing your friends or your mom you know it's about wanting to get it out there so other people can see it and that those beginning steps can be kind of difficult because you don't really know who to talk to or or where to go so that knowledge that I've built up over over a period of 10 years, that's kind of where I come into play and I kind of, I can help, um, you know, because now I'm, some of these projects I'm working on, it's like, it's, it's funny because I've been doing it for a while, so I'm like, hey, I can get you an exclusive on Rue Morgue. And you'd have thought that they just like fucking won the lottery, 
or something. But I, but I'm, I'm kind of at that point where, for me, and this kind of goes back in your last question. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Volumes of Blood or not, but it's an anthology series, and honestly, the whole. Now I haven't worked with. Uh, I've worked with William. I've worked with Sean back there, but uh, the whole purpose of creating Volumes of Blood was because I love collaboration. I love working with other filmmakers. Um, so that's kind of the whole reason I wanted to do Volumes of Blood was so I could reach out to like, you know, these guys. And, you know, I feel lucky that I'm getting a chance to meet some of these guys for the first time because we are doing a Volumes of Blood 3. And I, keep, I say it's the final installment, but you know how that goes. And uh, so, who, so who knows? But um, as far as like, for me, producing means reaching out and, and helping. I, I don't do this for money. I don't do this... You know, because I'm trying to get a payday or anything like that. It's it's about working with other filmmakers. It's about making something cool. This guy takes what we do when we're so exhausted at the end of a shoot, and we're like, this movie basically can go in a drawer. And he says, no, you ran out of gas. I'm gonna put this thing out here in front of the world. And he puts all his energies and efforts behind the picture. And that's what you guys come to see. Because if it wasn't for the producer, we'd just be out of gas, out of money, and with something that's in a drawer. So. I'm gonna let you talk for me for the rest of this time because that's that sounds and that's kind of like Nawbone. I mentioned Nawbone earlier. Uh, Darren Means, who I think has been on this panel before, um, they did Nawbone and they and then they had no idea what they were gonna do with it. Um, for, I mean, for them it was a passion project, and like most of these movies, that's what they are. For us, they're passion projects. Um, and then I, he had caught wind of some of the things that I was working on, so he contacted me and we got talking about it and. And um, so I'm, that's kind of what I did is I came on to his project to kind of help him get more exposure. I kind of helped with a re-edit and now we're looking at like distributors and things of that nature. So that's pretty much what, as far as like producing, that, that's where I come into play. Now I noticed, um, this kind of goes to all the Louis, Louisville locals here. Um, I noticed when I was looking at you, you guys' body of work, kind of each of you, there's a lot of anthologies going on. Here, a lot more than you see. They're like, I, I dig the anthology format. Why is that kind of something big that I see you guys doing that there's not a whole lot of indie anthologies coming out right now? I feel like um, anthologies are popular because, like he said, you can collaborate with other directors. You can have, uh, you can direct a 25 minute short film and then another director can do a 25 minute short film and, you know, maybe two more and you've got. A solid uh, movie and it's just sometimes uh, you've got to uh, stick with a theme if you want it you know to flow you know a certain way you know so it's it, it is kind of working with the other directors on an anthology but we'll let him talk about that since he's just fresh off of an anthology with, and two, just the pure numbers game, it's just way more people to promote your project when it's done. Right. I'm, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of truth to that. I mean, I, as far as anthologies go, I think, I think what's great about anthologies, and this is something I think we all suffer from nowadays, is that most people, we, we have so much going on in our lives, and we, we're, you know, our brain is constantly moving. Um, our attention spans have gotten really short. Um, but so the great thing about an anthology film is that you can hit somebody with something for like 15 minutes, 20 minutes at a time, and then hit them again. And plus the other good thing about anthologies is that, um, and this <laughs> to some degree is coming from what some of the critics have said about like Volumes of Blood, is that, um, you know, if, if you go into something and you don't particularly care for what you're watching in that moment, then there's always that hope that what you'll see next in the next 10 minutes or whatever is going to catch your attention and you'll really like it. Cause we all we all know that watching anthologies they can be hit and miss uh, with the segments. Right, like um, Creep Show. Uh, everybody has their favorite one. Right. Out of Creep Show, Creep Show Two. You know, you you right. like them all, but there's one that you you know, it does uh, go back to the whole. EC Comics, you know, three hosts in one book, you get three different tries for the horror, you know? Dark side. For me, uh, I've got a lot of guys that have approached me about anthologies, and I just kind of steer away from them because I'm worried about, is this guy's picture going to be the sucky one out of them all, and it's not going to work? 
or I don't know. Everyone's got a lot of great ideas. Like, let's do an anthology. Let's do an anthology. And I'm like, but you guys don't know what I'm going to put behind this. And if you're not going to put behind it what I'm putting behind it, then I'm worried. Well, it's funny that you say that because so producing an anthology, I I was a part of every single segment. Whereas like the directors, they only knew about you know what their segment was, and they had no idea what the other filmmakers were doing. And I and I kid you not, I had the same conversation with every director, and that is, have I made the shitty segment? Is my segment the shitty segment? And I'm like, no, your segment's not the shitty segment. Now, of course, <laughs> there, to some degree, there might be a little bit of, you know, lie going in there. But I think, like, you know, I don't ever think anybody made a shitty segment. There's going to be better segments than others. Um, but the good thing is, is, you know, with, like, the sequel, we really stepped it up. So looking at the first volumes of Blood, I can tell you that the segments get better as they go along. But in the second volumes of Blood, I think they're all equally, they have, they all have really good merit. And I'm not saying that just because I'm a part of the film and I'm, but you know, you trying. you have to, like, say, well, like, you better step your story up a little bit or step your game up. Well, um, and I, I don't consider myself tyrannical, but the, the, the volumes of Blood films, the way they were set up is it's not, it's not a random series of shorts. So from the get-go, like, the first film takes place entirely in a library. So everything's interconnected, and the stories were made to be. They can they, they sit separately, but they're also they also can, they make one. It's not like separate shorts that make a feature. It's different segments that make one film. So, um, but b being the producer and like the creator of it, it made it easy for me to go. All right, well this is you know we're gonna have to do this. Or we're gonna have to do that. Now I, I would say I worked pretty well. I mean Sean directed one of the sequel segments so but he, he came to me and I mean he, he was like I got a lot of issues with some you know with, with some of this and I, I you know I want to change this or I want to make do this and I make this better this way and and that's what I want though like I'm not gonna go no this is scripture and that's how it has to be like at the end of the day it's about making it as good as it possibly can be and doing your very best and then once it gets out in the world people either think it's shit or they think it's good but you leave it up to them, but at least you can walk away saying, we tried our hardest to make something, you know, that was worth a damn. Uh-oh. <laughs> okay, I'm not even going to tell you the name of this anthology because I don't want nobody to go looking for it. But... <laughs> I found it. <laughs> no, it's not, it's not the Horror Network. Okay. It's a different anthology. But, um, okay, so I had a director slash producer approached me about doing a short for an anthology that he was working on. This was in 2011. So I was like, okay, I had actually just finished a short film and it wasn't my best work. And, you know, I was almost like, God, I hope, you know, this is as good as the other ones. And then the movie got distributed and came out and I saw it and the other short films were atrocious. And I was sitting there thinking, you know, I, I could just tell that the guy who put the whole thing together, I won't name any names because some of y'all might know him, they didn't give a shit about this anthology. The first uh, story, y'all probably know Sean C. Phillips, was some YouTube movie that he threw together like 10 years ago and put on it in a current anthology. And then the next one was The Producers, and it took place in a backyard. It was about three minutes long, and all it was was two guys talking, and then the other guy killed the other guy with a hammer over uh, cheating on his girlfriend or something. And then, um, so basically what I was saying is, a lot of people approached me later and they were like, uh, you seem to be the only one that had any ambitious ambition with your short film for that project and I was like well I had no idea because these people were out of uh, LA and stuff and I sent you know what I had to them and then the other guys you know they just threw together a piece of paper. even the wraparound was horrendous and poorly edited so I don't really like to talk about it but I can see what you guys are talking about are you all going to step up your game because you know back then I didn't know I didn't know any better 
You know, I was just like, ooh, I get my horror film in an anthology, you know, and now I'm kind of like you guys. I'm like, oh, tell me about this. So I can definitely see where you all are coming from there. Hey, this is for uh, William down here on the end. Can, uh, first of all, can you tell us a little bit about uh, House by the Video Store and what that, what exactly that is? Uh, so it's a website that we started a couple years ago that mostly started out doing video reviews of horror movies. Because uh, at the time, most of the videos you saw there about horror movies were just kind of somebody sitting in a bedroom in a dimly lit room talking about a movie. So the goal was to do video reviews that had a little bit more effort put into them. Uh, but that proved to take up a lot of time for very little gain. Uh, so then we started a podcast and then uh, entered a 48-hour uh, film competition a couple years ago and won. And then kind of just tilted more in the direction of doing film stuff after that. Because at least with that, you have a tangible thing out in the world that people will like or not like, but it's not just a video review of something that can be taken down from YouTube at any moment because the studio changed their mind on clips from their movie. Right. Now, speaking speaking as a reviewer and someone who covers horror media, like, all of us want to make horror movies. That's just the way it is. What was kind of the kick in the ass that got you guys, like, over the hump to actually going from reviewing them to making them? Um, well, we did we did the reviews. We tried to have them start out with kind of skits or, or a little bit of you know intro to them, and we're just like we're spending so much time and effort on this. Let's just go ahead and make something that's an actual short or work on a film. And then um, uh, so Sean is here. He signed us up for the forty eight hours. Like this will force us to do it. We have you know we got a time limit. Got to do it. And then if anybody wants to do filmmaking, those are great opportunities because for nothing else, it's networking. If you make a crap product. You met people and people saw you around and would be more interested to work, work with you in the future just knowing that you made something. So just, uh, if you have the equipment and the time, might as well do something. And that's a, at least with that, you know somebody's gonna see it. It's not going out into the ether because they'll have a screening and people will be forced to sit there to see theirs. <laughs> so. Really, PJ, I mean, that's the re is that kind of the reason why you brought me on Vlogging the Blood? Because that's really all I had to show for it was that short, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I saw what you guys were doing, yeah. and that's why I got in touch with yeah. you. I, for us, it was as simple as doing that 48, and then it was and you know, and that's how it worked out. What's, what's crazy about what you were saying about is just jump on there, jump in there and do it. Look, we're in the Midwest. We're not in Los Angeles or New York. No one's beating our doors down to make a movie or be in a movie. So you have to be proactive, build your own house, get a little camera, get a story. It may not be the best one. And for the like first four or five years of my career, all I heard were people was saying, you're getting better. And that's the best compliment I think I could ever get was people saying, hey, we see you out there trying, you're shooting, we know there are B-movies, but like from the last one you did, this one's better. And that was what I, it fueled me. And, and too, and not in LA, people are generally excited to be involved in a project uh, because they don't get that, it's not commonplace. Nobody's saying, oh, to shoot my car, apartment complex hallway, $6,000. People are usually like, oh, I'll be glad to help. Do you want food too? <laughs> well, here in the Midwest, we have a, a problem in our Indiana Filmmakers Network. Uh, we, we talked about this at the last meeting. We have a uh, it's famine or feast thing, and we're so afraid that if we say no to a project that we might not get that opportunity the next time. In LA or New York, it's no, 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 sorry about you, and that's normal behavior. But here in the Midwest, because he's wanting to make an anthology or whatever, and I have to say yes, because I don't know if I'm gonna work on something. But then it might be a shitty project, and then here you go, my name's out there with that. But in the Indiana and in the Midwest, we have that problem, and we have to say no, because sometimes when you say yes, you will get the most unprofessional behavior, and you have to deal with it, and it'll be, your name will be, be behind it, you know? So, it's a tough spot we live in, but we're working, we're doing it, we're sitting here on this panel, so. Now, one thing I noticed about uh, the ones you directed, is, in particular, is the, um, your use of static shots and really setting up a you know a frame as opposed to you know how handheld shaky cam is kind of the predominant way of shooting right now, and uh, Brooklyn in uh, she's so pretty you kind of had you did shaky cam the first half of the movie and a lot of static uh, shots in the second half, so I want to know why you chose to do it that way and if anyone else wants to speak on kind of the the merits and detriments of with either style of uh, shooting once Brooklyn's done go for it. All right, so I'm going to tell you the lying answer first. Um, the movie is about a serial killer, and the first half, uh, he's still coming to terms with all of the things he's doing, and he's still kind of fresh, and so when you're walking around with him at the beginning of that film, it's handheld because I want you to feel that feeling that he's feeling. You're unsafe, you know, you're, you're feeling weird, and then 
later when he's in his home and he's comfortable it's you know it's that lockdown you know so you you're comfortable with him you're like and you start to feel gross about it because you're like ooh why do i feel comfortable i'm in a serial killer den but you just feel better cuz you're not like moving around but in reality i shot that movie over a year for fun with my friends and at the beginning i had zero idea what i was doing i just wanted to make a movie so i tried really hard and by midway i got a lot better because i'd done more research and uh, <laughs> there's the shots we shot later so that's the real she was so pretty and it's screening tonight at 9 with the commentary i'll talk to you over it and it'll be really fun and, and there's free jello shots free jello shots is really <laughs> viral. Hey, oh and a prize pack uh, and at the end we announced the winner you know we'll do uh, we we handed out a secret way, so I can't tell you, but because that'll give away. No, I could be. We could whatever's left over, you could take that. But but no, the prize pack is like 150 dollars worth of cool stuff, horror toys, you know, cards, everything, movies, VHS, DVDs. So somebody leaves with all that stuff after the movie. They just have to sit through the whole thing. That's like the kicker. Woo! And we're showing the teaser for our new movie, and it's not on YouTube, and it's not out yet. This is like the first place you'll get any kind of peek into it. So, a little, a little special for Days of the Dead, because we love you. Yeah, he's holding the disc of it right now. Don't steal that. I guess would be too, like, part of it was each short's been shot a little bit differently, just trying to figure out what style works for, you know, the storytelling ideas are going, you know, like, you know, framing things in a way that actually coincides with the story versus how can we shoot more quickly? Because uh, a lot of stuff we spent a lot of time. So some of the static shots, like in the short film we did, Hazard came out of uh, crashing five shots down to one because he ran out of time. That was the one in particular yeah. I noticed the really well put together static shots on. Yeah. So that then we just saw like, oh, through this barn door, it looks, you know, do like the thirds thing. So that it worked out pretty well. But then the other ones have all just been trying out like, okay, let's do some slider shots. Let's do some uh, gimbal stuff. Let's try just different shots and see what works and what doesn't. So at this point, I think you have a pretty good idea of like, you know, moving into doing features, like what shooting style would, would be quick, but still get across what we're trying to do. Now, Nathan, uh, before you did Headless, you did a flick called Unwelcome, a short, which featured something that I think is sorely missing in movies these days. It had a theme song. And Volumes of Blood also has a theme song. So, you know, why is that not something that's done more? Because it's such a cool idea to have the movie have its own theme song. I, I have no clue. I literally, how can you watch Nightmare on Elm Street Part 3 and come away from that and be like, why doesn't every film have Dream Warriors? Why, why don't movies that are not Dream Warriors not include the song Dream Warriors? So it was just very important to me on like my first like official short that was like, uh, it was just really important to me that on my first official short, it was like, I want to put in everything that I like about horror movies because I might not be able to make a second one of these. And luckily I got to make a few things. But, so I, I wanted that and I happened to have friends who were in a horror punk band. And I was like, will you please write me a theme song like Dream Warriors? And they were like, yes, I will. And uh, so yeah, I, I don't know why bands don't do that. I feel like there's a... a contingent because I feel like soundtracks now are becoming popular again and with vinyl and everybody wants a piece of the movie um, I think there's a market for it so maybe there should be a She Was So Pretty disco song <laughs> you know what I think we all just live in that fear that it will, it'll never be Dream Warriors and so we just like hide under the table like it's never going to be that so I'm not going to do it but it's not Dream Warriors it can at least be the theme from New Wave Hookers That's true. which is great in its own right PJ, is that why you went for doing a theme song for uh, Volumes of Love? Uh, I, I think it, it kind of goes into, you know, what he said. It's like all these films or a majority of these films, and horror films especially, that we grew up with and that we loved, they all had these, these things about them that were original and specific to them. And to me, it was, you know, theme songs and, and there's all, you know, there's all kinds of different little nuances throughout some horror films. And that's like with Volumes of Blood, that's... I'm really big on that, so that's why I wanted like original music, and you know, I try to contact like like with the first film. I got in touch with. Uh, can I talk about Horror Hound while I'm here? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> I don't buy into that whole stupid feud bullshit. But like, uh, but you know, I got in touch with Horror Hound, and, and we had Nathan Thomas Milliner. He did a, an original like cover, so we got to have the magazine and the. So it was just you know all the like little cool things like that that maybe for 
most viewers don't really mean much, but like for horror fans, us, when you see those things, you're like, wow, that's really cool. And, and it, to a degree, also, I think it kind of ups the production value in a way because it's, you know, it's not that you just went out and not there's anything wrong with this, but you didn't just go out and just get random songs. You have some that are just very specific to the project that you're doing. Now, Volumes of Blood 2, the, uh, the framing device is uh, a couple of horror geeks talking all about movies. And one of the things they say is something I've said forever. Why are they remaking all the classics? Why don't you go back and remake the bad horror movies? And that's exactly what you did. But that's what you call a segue, folks. They, um, what really drew you to Criminally Insane, which is kind of an obscure flick to pick to do a remake of? What drew you to that and uh, got you got that project going? Uh, well, in about 2005, that's when I... Is this on? Um, <laughs> in 2005, I... Uh, I think that's around when I first saw Criminally Insane. I wasn't fortunate enough to see it as a child. But um, the first thing I, the first time I noticed it, I, I can't remember what movie I was watching, but the trailer was on um, a different movie. And I just saw this fat lady with a cleaver killing people because she was hungry. And I was like, I gotta see that movie. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, uh, I think I went to, uh, Amazon or something and found a copy and we me and my friend Doug watched it who also uh, helped make the film he's the cinematographer and we just really loved the movie and we were like God what would this be like today you know like if this film was made today you know how what what approach would you take and blah 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 so we kind of left it at that and then without Doug's knowledge I uh, I emailed um, the distributor that put out the original Criminally Insane and I asked them to give the whoever has the rights to Criminally Insane my information and have them call me and I'm thinking I'll never hear anything from these people well I was I, I was taking a nap like two weeks later and the phone rang and it was an unknown number which I usually don't pick up on and uh, I woke up kind of in a daze and I was like hello and he was like this is Nick Millard and I was like, who? Because I had just woken up. And he was like, Nick Millard, the director of Criminally Insane. And I was like, oh, I'm awake. <laughs> and we, uh, me and him talked for about an hour and a half on the phone. I told him what we wanted to do. I told him our budget restrictions, which he was very uh, nice because he gave the rights for much less than you would think. And... To answer your question, <laughs> um, we just really enjoyed the movie and thought that it could be improved upon. Um, I'll always like the original movie better, even though this is a, you know, a more serious, darker version. Um, I was very specific about every death in the movie being uh, kind of uh, different from what you've seen. And then, you know, we wanted to throw in a couple of classic deaths, you know, like the, you know, in, in, in a lot of Friday the 13th movies where it's kind of a camera trick, you throw the weapon and, you know, pan the camera real quick and they've got the weapon stuck in their face. So we wanted to do stuff like that and we, we really pulled off a pretty good kill there. Um, but I'm really proud of some of the death scenes in the movie because I paid very close attention to them. Some of them, you know, you plan a certain death scene and they don't turn out exactly how you wanted it and you may have to cut it down a little bit. Um, but overall, I think uh, it turned out really good. I'm really happy with it. I think it's a solid indie slasher and I hope people like it. Now, Bobby. Uh, one of the things that whenever, I think I said this when I've reviewed most of your movies, I feel that your strength as a filmmaker is in capturing atmosphere. That's kind of, you know, your, you know, stock of trade right there. How, what is your secret to how you do it? What is the most important thing into infusing a film with atmosphere? Yes, Bobby, give us your secrets. <laughs> well, I, um, I'm a big fan of Stephen King. And when I did his Dollar Baby program, it kind of made me get more in depth with what he was doing. And he says, you can't write about something unless you know about it. So everything that I write, I always pull some personal life experience that I've been through into that. So I feel it, and that's what you get. 
Hey, you, know, you, speak, you say you can't write what you don't know. Speaking of writing, uh, Nathan, I've read, heard you say that on Headless, you just kind of shot for the moon on that script and you know whatever they could do, they could do. But Brooklyn, I've heard you say that you, when you were writing She Was So Pretty, you specifically went for what you knew you had and could do. So I kind of want to hear from all of you where between those two extremes you lie when you're writing. Well, for me, I, I started writing kind of to the places that I knew we would have access to. Um, also, I, you know, I kind of had the advantage or disadvantage, however you want to look at it, of having the small amount of headless is in bound. And so I had to be able to be like, okay, whatever I write has to be able to encapsulate this. But after a certain point, I just realized I want a body pit. I want an eyeball tree. Me, me, I want. Damn it, I don't need to be the producer. I fuck the producer. That's his his problem, his headache. And I started to talk to Arthur uh, Culifer, who directed Headless. And he finally was like, why don't you put those things in there? He's like, well, I'll make sure we get it, because I want an eyeball tree and I want a body pit. And so at that point, I was just like, I'm going to write what I'm going to write. And I mean, I wouldn't have written, you know, the killer screams up into the moonlight and then there's a huge crane shot and, but maybe I would have and maybe we would have tried to make it and, and, and not. There was definitely things in the headless script that didn't make it into the script and maybe they'll show up some other time in, in another thing, but uh, really for me it was like I'm going to tell the story that I, I see in my head and they'll pull me back, you know, or they'll just tell me flat out we can't do this but, you know, we decided... For example, we wanted to have a roller rink in the film, and we kind of went crazy trying to find it, and we finally found it, and it turned out to be perfect, because when we finally find, found the roller rink that uh, let us shoot in there, it was a guy who was a horror nut who had Elvira posters up on his office, and he let us put blood down, and he charged us 300 bucks in a case of Corona to let us shoot there for the day, and it was the cheapest you know, case of Corona we ever bought because we got so much out of it. Um, I don't know. Uh, I just, at some point, it was just like, fuck it, you know, I'm gonna write. I don't know what you guys feel like. Well, I spent zero dollars on my first film, so uh, we were really limited, a lot. And we just wanted to have a good time. So it was like, well, I have a house with a uh, creepy workroom. I was like, I'm gonna make it a serial killer den because, you know, it already kind of looks like one. And so I was like, and I've, I've been studying serial killers since I was a kid, because my mom is like also a weirdo. So she was like, hey, check. She was like, check out this Ted Bundy book. And I was like, okay. I have one in my bathroom. Right? It's good reading. And so I, I just fell in love with that stuff when I was young. This, the mind is so crazy. And I was like, well, like, I have all this knowledge. I'm gonna, let's just do it. And so zero bucks later, we just, filmed it and had some fun and I don't know sometimes you just got to look at what you can do a serial killer is way better you know to try to conquer than a giant monster that's going to cost millions of dollars to make like I, I can't afford to make a monster so instead I made a human monster and, you know he's back there in the corner <laughs> I feel like whenever I write a whenever I write I don't limit it at all because you can always change it you know if 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 you are going to film something in your script and you realize that you can't achieve that at the time, you can always tone it down. But if you're trying to limit yourself while you're writing, I think you can you can get writer's block easier that way because you have to stop to think, oh, well, can I use a roller ring like what he said earlier? You know, maybe I shouldn't write that in the script well, it's good that he wrote that in the script because he did end up finding it. And if he wouldn't have, you know, he probably could have toned it down and, and used something else. But yeah, try to write, you know, whatever. And if we can do it, we can. If, if we can't, we just change it up at the time. Anyone else want to weigh in on that one? I was gonna say, um, Hello. Uh, as far as it's a like, big room, we need the mics badly. Is, I, yeah, I know. I don't know why we keep grabbing them, honestly. Uh, here, 
this sounds good. Force a habit. <clears throat> so, uh, as I I do a lot. Hey, what's up? <laughs> I do a lot of the writing on like the volumes of blood films. I mean, I have my hey. So, <laughs> well, yeah. Fuck YouTube. Uh, <laughs> I'm just saying. That's from a that's from a producer. Oh, okay. No. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> what happened when I was gone? No, no, no. I it's totally started up. I fucked off the producer. The that I'm no, so like when it comes to uh, when it for me when it comes to writing now, a lot of it's like you know write what you know. Um, with the first volumes of blood, it was more about like the twists and stuff like that. And I think in a lot of ways the stories kind of suffered because of that. Um, but like going into the sequel. For us, it was more about, um, and here's probably where I get a little artsy fartsy or pretentious, but it, for, it was more about like the characters and the story, and and then the horror was there, but it kind of came in second. I mean, we never really, you know, we, we never, we knew that we couldn't do things like have a horde of a thousand monsters, because I, I'm more practical effects, and I try to stay away from anything that deals with CGI. I mean, these Thank guys you. tell you. Uh, for, for me, going above and beyond is like the original script for Volumes of Blood Horror Stories had 23 kills. Um, we the, the entire film was was uh, funded through sponsorships, and we ended up getting more money than what we had originally budgeted for. So at that point, I was like, hell yeah, we're going to put some more kills in. So now the body counts 30 for the sequel. But... Yeah, there, it's there's it's called volumes of blood, so you get your volumes of blood. But but I, I think I want blood. If it's if blood's oh, you, in the title, you, you I want blood. blood. I'm a big gore hound, so I love I love a good visceral practical kill. But but with the sequel too, it was like one of the things that uh, one of the things that we really got to spend money on. For instance, like when it came to writing, is was going into characters was costuming. I I always said, why do you need a, a you know, why do you need a wardrobe person when you have Walmart? You know, because it was like, do you really need to spend that much money? But then I found out very quickly we ended up getting a, uh, a costume designer. And Julie back there, who's in the film, she plays one of the characters. And her costume, it was incredible. It's one of the most iconic things that, that I... So when she walked on a set with this costume, it was like... It was just like, you know, for me, I didn't need... Uh, you know, like a plane crash or, you know, a, an explosion or anything like that. Like, that that's what made this movie was, was, you know, that we got to take these characters and bring them, really bring them to life through through how they look, through costuming and stuff like that, and plus making the, the story better. Now, I do have my scripts where I have plane crashes and, and things like that, but those are, for, for me, those are like, if I ever break out or something and someone's like, hey, here's $8 million, then okay, I'll be able to do my plane crash. But for now, I'm going to do what I know that I can do, and that's work with, you know, story, character, and things of that nature. How about you? Then uh, with me, I usually try to start out with the concept or the idea of what I want to accomplish and then come back to, okay, how can I... Because everything's just coming out of my pocket, so it's like, okay, what am I comfortable with spending? I'll write this to okay, we don't need to get this location, we can shoot it somewhere else, this will substitute. Because like, the last short we did was supposed to be in a police interrogation room, we just shot it in my parents' basement, because it was a room with no wall, or no windows on the walls. And I got like a fake security camera for $7 off Amazon and stuck it on the wall. So it's like, this is good enough, versus trying to pay somebody grand to go shoot in some room for eight hours or something. So I usually come up with the concept I want and then narrow it down to what I can actually accomplish on the amount of money and time that we'll have, so. Uh, we are quickly running out of time here, so before we uh, before we call this, I want to just go down the line and please tell everybody where they can find your stuff and you know what they need to know to check out your flicks. Start here and move down. Uh, you can find Headless at headlessmovie.net. Um, if you try to find uh, the clown movie that we made, um, I can just come to you and slap you because I swear <laughs> to God that would be more enjoyable. Um, <laughs> But yeah, again, uh, I would say that right now I'm not pitching anything, so listen to these guys and buy their shit. And let me tell you real quick though, uh, I do want to say this, is the, the question about why don't we all work together, I mean I think it's a great idea, but I'll, I'll tell you this much, when I'm behind a table here hawking my stuff, 
which is not very much anymore because the yeah. bandit guys usually do that. But really, I would send people to your guys' table look at the split. Like, I, I think the cool thing is, is none of us are really stepping on each other's toes. You know, we all kind of are doing our own little thing. And I don't think that one, you know, at all outweighs the other. And for my money, I mean, it's cool to meet the celebrities and stuff, but these are the people who make me nervous. I just want you to like my damn post on Facebook. <laughs> That's the support I want. I, I'm an introvert even online, so. Bye. Uh, the Devil Dogs Aquilo Company, we are wrapping our pre-sale September the 8th. You can get that at www.thedeviladogsakilocompany.com. Belly Timber will be starting its pre-sale in October. The Dead Bodies in 223 is looking for international distribution right now. And Car 86, which we shot with Mayor Greg Ballard's son uh, from Indianapolis. It's over. Yeah. That uh, <laughs> will be screening at Horror Hound September 8th. Uh, so feel free to check it out. All of our stuff. PJ? Uh, the first Volumes of Blood is on, uh, if anybody has Amazon Prime, uh, you can see it for free, and uh, but you can order it offline. Um, Blu-ray DVD is out there. There's also a special edition steel book. If you're into that, um, nobody wants that. But if you're into that, you, I love yeah, you, you can get, and it comes with a, an insert, um, like a vintage uh, lobby card. That's actually kind of cool. I, I have to admit. Movie I had was but I'm a collector. Volumes of Blood has a steel book, so you should. I'm check a collector. That. Right. Um, the second Volumes of Blood came out a few weeks back. Uh, Volumes of Blood Horror Stories. It's on Blu-ray and DVD. September 12th. It hits uh, video on demand, so it'll be on like Dish Network, Google Play, Vudu, VHX, Amazon Prime, um, and that's really kind of the I guess the. The, the one main project is Volumes of Blood. Go check it out if you get a chance and, and let me know what you think. Love it or hate it. If I'm not mistaken, you all put a crazy fat Ethel poster in Volumes of Blood. We did. And once again, that goes back into the whole idea of, um, especially it was in the, the haters segment in the sequel because... I haven't the, seen uh, it yet, but I'll, um, I'll, I'll, you will check it out. It out. It's, it's, it's in there. It but, you know, we wanted to, you know, support other filmmakers so yeah we put we got like a plank face poster in there and a girl number three poster in there so there's 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 stuff throughout the entire film but yeah we have a we do have the crazy fat ethel in there um i have trashology on dvd and blu-ray which you can get on amazon barnesandnoble.com i think uh bestbuy.com i just go to amazon instead of you youtube know, Better not fucking be on YouTube. <laughs> no, actually, I think somebody did pirate it or, or torrent it. But don't watch torrent. Right? Right. Oh. Don't do the first volume of Blood has like 12,000 downloads. Oh. On torrent? Yeah. What? I, I will say this, though. When someone showed me that, I was like, holy shit, it's popular. <laughs> right? <laughs> And I was like, if Wait, I had a penny. Wait. Yes. Yeah, but nobody's paying for the shit. I know, but it was still kind of neat. I believe the easiest way to see Crazy Fat Ethel will be at midnight. Yes. Exactly. So Trashology is on DVD and Blu-ray. Um, it's a John Waters uh, trashy type comedy. Uh, took inspiration from John Waters for that movie. The Horror Network Volume 1 is on DVD, Amazon again. And Crazy Fat Ethel should be out in a couple of months, but like he said, you can see it tonight at midnight, and I recommend it. Um, yeah, you can watch She Was So Pretty tonight at nine. Shots. Shots. <laughs> and win prizes. Um, but also, Free posters. If, if you can't make it, you're lost. But also, you can watch it on Vimeo. Uh, you can rent it for 99 cents, because, you know, I mean, it's not, not a whole dollar. Uh, and then our new movie, um, we are premiering at a couple film fests, and then it will be coming hot fire for you at Christmas, because it's a holiday movie, so we're going to make it available so that you can buy it and mail it to all of your relatives that you hate. How, how long is the movie? Tonight? Yeah, how long is your film? Oh, it is an hour and 32 minutes. Okay. So you really got to work for that gift bag, if you want. <laughs> You're going to put it in. Uh, also, I wanted I wanted to shout out um, Heidi Moore. Uh, she made a movie called uh, Dolly Deadly, and I just watched it recently because I hadn't had any time. And I finally sat down, 
And, and if you like John Waters and you like cool girls who just make shit that, that is just like in your face and, and emotional, but still like gritty and awesome, watch her movie. Cause I'm telling you what, it was cool as shit. And um, at that same midnight screen, you also see the short films we've released so far get screened as well as the new one. Um, it's not out anywhere yet. Uh, you can go to our website, which is housefivevideostore.com, and we have all of our stuff. We've just only done short films so far. We've got, um, we just shot our seventh, and they'll all be out within the next couple months. we got a disc at the back if you want copies of our old shorts, so you can get that for free. Um, and you know we'll have more stuff working on next year for you know like on a feature something like that. Um, one of our shorts, uh, Hazard, has a clip in Volumes of Blood Horror Stories, <laughs> so you can check that out and see both things. Um, and actually, too, I did a behind the scenes on the disc, right? Yeah, so there's a behind the scenes video that's on that DVD Blu-ray. But yeah, our website you can see all of our stuff. We have a YouTube channel where all of our shorts go, so the website's the place to find links to all that stuff. Uh, before we cut it here, I want to say thank you to everyone here in the crowd because it's the guys like you who support indie horror that allow the people up here to do what they do. So give these guys a hand, but give your guest selves a hand too. All right, thank you all for coming to the Independent Filmmakers panel. Now everyone head directly to the screening room to watch. She was so pretty. Yay! And Jelly. Woo! I'm not the video store.com.